I'm thrilled to be here uh, and about to start the second panel. My name is Elizabeth McAllister. I teach in religion and African American studies up the road at Wesleyan. I work on Haiti and New York um, and Vodou and neo Pentecostalism. So, my, uh, it's a particular pleasure to start with our first speaker, Abimbola Adelekun, who is assistant professor in the African and African diaspora department at the University of Texas, Austin. The main thing you have to know about her is that her coming book is called Performing Power in Nigeria, Politics, Identity, and Pentecostalism. I have read in it. It is absolutely brilliant. It's coming out with Cambridge University Press in October. It's ready on Amazon for pre-order. And she's probably too modest to say all this, but I'm saying it because it's really a good, good, good book. Uh, second up, we're going to go straight through with questions at the end. Secondly, we'll hear from Jesse Shevin. Jesse Shevin is a sixth year PhD candidate in ethnomusicology at Columbia University, uh, researching topics including the trombone shout bands in the United House of Prayer for All People. So we can't wait to hear about that and hope that we'll be treated to some of that sonic pleasure and sonic healing. So without further ado, I give you uh, Professor Adele Kuhn. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Professor McAllister. I'm very grateful. You are right. I wouldn't have been able to talk about my book by myself. Um, my ongoing research is on performance and miracles, and my interest is, can everybody hear me very well? Okay. Yeah. It's, um, I'm looking at the kind of devices that make the unseen things seeable. And when I say devices, I mean that uh, I'm looking at things in terms of contraptions that go from technological devices to artistic performances. And my work is basically around Pentecostals in Nigeria, who for the simplest kind of comparison, you might say like the evangelicals in the USA, because they believe basically the same thing, the charismatic work of the Holy Spirit. And um, I'm looking at the various ways they invoke the unseen through a multiplicity of device means, and how those invocations evolve through advancement of technology. So, and you know, regarding technological advancement, there's been a lot of uh, groundbreaking studies and performance studies about how theatre has advanced with new technology. But people rarely touch religion, and that's one area that I'm very interested in exploring. And so today I will be talking about the performance of miracle during the COVID-19 pandemic. And so I will start with a story of a healing practice. So the camera zoomed into the monitor of the Mac desktop computer close enough to make the face of the man on his hospital bed somewhere in South Africa loom on the screen. The man, Advocate Masiko, that's his name, had on an oxygen mask. From my computer where I view the church service, I watch as Masiko narrated his condition to the pastor of the Synagogue Church of All Nations, SCOAN, that's the acronym of the church, and the rest of the digital congregation streaming the session on mobile devices from various countries. He said he was currently in the intensive care unit and wanted to be healed of his affliction. The video was pre-recorded and edited, and so the congregation that had gathered for the Sunday service also watched along with the pastor on their respective mobile devices as Masiko turned the camera on his phone around to show himself surrounded by the hospital personnel dressed in green scrubs and were working with some medical equipment. The pastor who was standing in front of the computer inside what looks like his office and where the digital session was being recorded prayed for Masiko. Producing anointing water stored in a spray bottle, the pastor doused the computer screen with it and declared Masiko healed in the name of Jesus. Masiko responded by writhing and groaning as the mystical force of both the anointing water and the prayers supposedly hit him on his hospital bed. Some minutes later in the video, Masiko was not only well enough to move his body as he could not do before, but he was also shown standing outside a building, the university's private hospital in Bloemfontein in South Africa. Both he and his wife, blue surgical mask hanging around their chin, testified to the miracle of the healing he had received. 
The video from one of Squan's Distance is Not a Barrier digital session then featured more instances of people who had also been sprayed with anointing water, accompanied by prayer commands through the screens of their iPads and cell phone being miraculously healed. Just like that, the performance of this spectacular miracle that presumes the possibility of an immediate visceral experience through the computer reconceptualizes the binary of being live co-present and having a mediated experience. This healing ritual supposes the presence of the divine sacred in the collapse of space and time, and that factor structures digital religious performances in charismatic churches like Skoan. So, taking this specific case of the healing of Masiko as an illustrative entity for the performance of virtual miracles, I interrogate religious performances executed similarly to digital theater to critically assess the dynamics of human and non-human presence when people perform in a sacred assembly mediated through technological materials. Miracles induce the supernatural to erupt normative reality the digital medium's distinctive attribute of achieving certain tasks with demonstrable ease, like sending messages across indeterminate distance with just a touch of the computer, produces the quality of the miraculous that intensifies its credibility as means of accessing divine presence. The healing of Masiko pushes the possibilities of transcending the time-space boundaries further and calls for a critical exploration of the dynamicism of presence, human and non-human, in religious rituals. Live streamed on the Squan's Facebook page in January 2021 during the COVID-19 pandemic, while there were still restrictions on mass gatherings and travel, the exigency of the inhibited movement galvanized the church's creative practice of anointing people with water through electronic screens. Though domiciled in Lagos, Nigeria, West Africa, Squan has a congregation that spans worldwide, as testified by their Facebook page, where they stream the healing of Masiko. The account has a membership strength of more than six million, and it's one of the largest church social media followings in the world. Although they typically use satellite television to reach their worldwide congregation, much of their activities take place in their physical church location in Lagos, Nigeria. However, embodied worship, as compelled by the very nature of Christianity, both evoked the anxiety of contagion among the congregants and could have attracted official censure during the crisis of the pandemic. A church like Skoan, reputed for healing and other miracles, imaginatively bypassed the enforced directives of the lockdown and social distancing, the means of curtailing the COVID-19 spread by creating other ways of maintaining live worship. Digital healing sessions, like Distance is Not a Barrier, allowed Squan summon thousands of their members to worship despite the enforced restrictions. This spectacle of interactive healing through computers that radically reimagines presence, immediacy, and affect across time and space helps Squan to resolve the conundrum of the state mandated restrictions on the social interactions of bodies during the global pandemic. So in studying the performance of this miracle, I started with a few simple questions. One, how does a miracle like this work? Or how is it taken by the congregation to have worked? Two, what are the existing systems of knowledge and beliefs held by the congregation that underwrite the efficacy of this performance? And so to understand this, that the performance of a miracle that presumes that a human body can be viscerally touched through a digital screen, I first walk through how religious studies have argued the concept of media in religious practices and how performance studies too have taken the question of life presence. And so I'll take you through some of the theoretical argument. Now, as modern technological means of communication evolved, studies of liveness and dynamics of presence have increasingly captured the dynamic factors that determine how liveness figures in each era. For instance, media studies reckoning with the expansiveness of technological means to generate liveness, whether as live presence or the ability to make spontaneous connections, have looked beyond the primacy of the media technology itself to the innate longing for sociality and transcendence and the sociopolitical forces that turn this desire into a social technology. 
For communication scholar Jeremy Stolos, he says the phrase religion and media itself is pleonastic because religion is always mediated. Its practices either unfold through a medium that transmits the sacred to practitioners to experience divine presence or through the route which supernatural beings take to manifest humans. Anthropologist Virgin Mayer also argues that the mediatory practices make religion sensible and sensational in the sense that they allow apprehension, a process of multisensory integration and discernment that makes religion both ultimately perceptible and spectacular when it's performed. Both of them noted how religion mediates between here and there, the visible or material world and the invisible transcendental plane through practices and objects that can, of course, include even digital artifact. According to Stolo, buried within the internet's drive towards instantaneous disembodied information exchange, one finds the ancient desire to approximate the unblemished rapport of angels, spirit, and other divine beings. Application of technological devices to breach the material world and the realm believed to be inhabited by supernatural forces, such as gods, deities, angels, and other spectral forces, show how relations between people and the non-human materialize through mediatory practices. And um, liveness, as seen in the visceral aspect of the healing of Masiko, reflects how much further the transcendental connections made possible through the tools of mediation and within the rarefied sacred atmosphere where live and alive forces converge can go. Devices like Mac computers and cell phones already diffused into everyday practices enhance the human and non-human connection. Now, the way both Stolo and Meyer now consider religion as media as tautological is analogous to how this performance study scholar, Philip Oslander, asserts that performance itself is a technology. Performance is a technique of craft of making things, and as since it mediates audience experience of its affective force, it can be construed as a technology in itself. This way, performances that engage digital devices, like we see with the healing of Masiko, is a merger of different technologies that range from embodiment to expressions through digital forms. This assertion that performance is both a medium and technology brings out the ontology of performance as a mediation process and as one of the device diverse means of conjuring presences, an important observation that clarifies why performance is integral to charismatic Christianity that characteristically emphasizes the agency of the unseen. So whether co-present in a physical church or a virtual one, worship is mediated as long as there's a reliance on artifices to negotiate the terrains of meaning and ultimately reconcile natural reality with the supernatural. For Christianity and even African indigenous religion, where there is a subsistent belief that embodied presence exists outside time and space, the exigency of the pandemic galvanized the application of these ideas to facilitate a transition to e-churches. And several pastors were against the idea of electronic churches, but these churches were quick to reorganize themselves and then have all these sessions on um, Facebook. Understanding performances as a medium and technology for summoning presence allowed a logical and theological departure from in-person meetings privileged by religious practitioners because of the thought that intimacy, absorption, and immediacy that embodied expressions generate cannot be mediated. The digital medium stretched the possibilities of creating an illusion that transported church folks outside their immediate reality through its artifices. Congregations saw that they could be live and their liveness reflected by physical touch across time and space, even without co-presence. That Masiko was healed in South Africa by a minister in West Africa, even without embodiment, indexes religious capability to not only mediate between the immanent and the transcendent, but to also employ digital artifacts to materialize both the means and ends of such mediatory practices. In essence, the miracles stretched through these machines worked because they aligned with both the African and the Pentecostal religious conception of mediation. Religion is always mediated, and performance is a technique of this mediation. When performance is devised as a technology of accessing the supernatural, even when they seem ridiculous, 
people can suspend their disbeliefs, not simply by going into a fictive mode like they do in theater where they talk about the suspension of dis disbelief, but to accept that this device, this contraption, this artifice, in whatever form it comes, is able to materialize unseen realities. But again, churches like this Kwan did not merely transfer church services online during the pandemic lockdown, but they also actively engaged uh, encourage using the interactive features of social media to boost and sustain audience engagement, generate a lively exchange, and make the church page a vibrant, performative space for self-expression, sociality, and the manifestation of A-life presences. And this was part of the ways it worked, because they were able to appropriate the sociality of the medium into the whole in church interaction. That is also why when co co congregants gather for the church in this digital assembly of social media, they also perform various activities, including prayers to solicit the divine, and the pastor or prophet, who functions as God's human viceroy, plays an integral role in filtering or mediating power from the supernatural to the natural. In the intense moment that, is, that typify these assemblies, congregants also relay personal stories that provide a snapshot of the predicament they brought before God. Sometimes they display their medical report and their helplessness in procuring either quality medical services or the money to pay for them. These account as much as prayers as their means of emotional healings for some of the beleaguered people. Some share testimonies and their personal resolutions are vowels they take as a turning point in their autobiographies. In a digital church gathering, the congregant's impulse to share with God and man becomes even more compulsive because the means are readily available through the interactive tools of social media. They narrate testimonies, unprompted account of God's goodness to them and their dear ones that demonstrate their gratitude. Some of these testimonies are followed by intonations of collective affirmation by other congregants. People also express their desire for an optimized life or merely state their liturgical observations as they watch the service. Now, so let me just say, okay, digital congregant does maintain some semblance of co-presencing through dialogical processes of showing sensitivity to one another's prayers and mutual attunement. Their integrations, interactions are not just between themselves, but also with the sacred divine presumed present and other demonic forces that need to be overcome. Words spoken in this moment are either affirmatory of triumphal fate or a denouncement of militating forces, or does both. The dynamic ways believers use the digital medium allow them to effectively highlight and challenge the forces, draining the vivaciousness of their respective lives while also soliciting the benevolent forces that can issue a corrective to life's quandaries. Their diverse pronunciation draws the other presences in the assembly because they reflect the social consciousness, the social spirit that connects the body politic with those visceral bodies seeking to be touched with anointing water or pastors healing hands across time and space. The spirit forces in the assembly appear with the congregants on the electronic screen as expressions of the buildup of the social factors that structure their circumstances and for which they have employed the medium or the technology of digital performances as contrivances to reach God, the ultimate power who can provide answers. So in lieu of warm bodies gathered to witness and participate in the healing of Masiko, as often happens in a physical church, is now a disembodied congregation expressing the performative intensity of their prayers to generate the spirit of the assembly. They congregate within the digital commons to render their prayers by typing them into the comment section while simultaneously watching the live stream of the pre-recorded video of Masiko respond to the anointing water sprayed on him through the flat surface of a Mac computer. The multisensory engagement through the transmedia interactions, the split subjectivity, the mightily uncalling feeling of encountering one reflection through discrete mobile devices, and the ephemerality of streaming video might have combined to phenomenally, phenomenally increase the intensity and even heighten the expectations of the miraculous. In this moment of tuning in to watch the healing of Masiko and feverishly typing out one's individual anguish, before the sacred presence, whose, before the sacred divine, whose presence is being mediated through the computer, people sometimes also stop and read each other's comments as they emerge on screen in real time, and the comments quickly build up into a mass of desire to be fulfilled by the sacred divine. Mutually sharing intersubjective inter experiences through prayers becomes the locus of the divineness of 
of the liveness of the digital church. And so let me just go to the end because my time is very good. That um, Masako's healing through anointing water spread through a computer served as a live ontology that prompted other actions and interactions in the electronic assembly. The miracle of his healing became the object of attunement that facilitate concerted actions among congregants. The miracle produced a notion of liveness to which the congregants reacted and thereby animated other surrounding non-human presences. Watching Masiko being spectacularly healed and trained collective focus and directed congregational attunement to an otherworldly presence that could grant the desires they expressed in the comment sections of Facebook and to the A-Life presence that could also malevolently content their miracles. The online worshippers fixating on his spectacular healing made the action of healing a frame of reference, spurring the rest of the electronic congregants to pray along and list their personal desires to witness a similar eruption of normative reality as Masiko was doing on the screen. They were led to pour their deep and subjective passions in prayer as both a currency of communal col collaboration with other live e-congregation members and also a rendering of subjective truth born out of their interaction with the non-human presences. The collective effervescence within this assembly generated out of their fingers and through the digital medium that connect them live and in real time allow the spirit of the assembly to culminate, making the theatricality of the worship event spiritual. Thank you. I first want to say thank you for doing my literature review for me. We share so many of the same references that I, I think this pairing is going to work really well, uh, especially when we get to, to questions. Uh, and Professor McAllister, the music is coming towards the end, so just hold on, it's, it's coming. Um, these are uh, sort of preliminary thoughts about some, some experiences from my dissertation research. Uh, and so I just want to sort of, oh my. Uh, sort of the, the big question that, I, that I'm trying to deal with here is sort of very related to the last talk. Um, you know, thinking about what sorts of presuppositions about how worship works are required in order to legitimize things like internet church, Zoom church, uh, what allows these things to be taken as sort of meaningful experiences uh, or not, as, as, as in the case of uh, this uh, presentation. So in this paper, I will reflect on some contrasting ways that church communities in Harlem dealt with interruptions to their musical worship practices in 2020, when stay-at-home orders take out my mask. When stay-at-home orders made it impossible to gather to praise God in the sanctuary, when worshipers were prohibited from gathering in person to sing or perform sacred music, many communities opted to move services onto live streaming or video conferencing platforms. Many, but not all. In the following. I draw on journalistic sources in addition to materials and observations gathered during my dissertation fieldwork at the New York Mother House, the Harlem home of the United House of Prayer for All People, a predominantly African-American apostolic church denomination, which did not opt to participate in Zoom church. I argue that embedded in the different ways that church communities responded to the pandemic and isolation crises, are deeply divergent understandings of the value of musical worship, the function of corporate prayer, and the mechanisms of divine presence. Moreover, as I turn to newspaper articles, sermons, and published testimonies to recount the stories told by these church communities about some of the darkest moments of the pandemic, I will sketch the co-constituted relations between music, media technologies and the domains of worshipful discourse and practice through the themes of healing, presence, and in the last instance, authority. The issues uh, I raise in this talk rearticulate familiar questions in the anthropology of religion. What are the means that facilitate worshipers' encounters with divine presences, and how do these encounters figure into the formation of community, from the bonds of affiliation that bring worshipers together to the forms of authority and power that reinforce normative behaviors? These sorts of questions are increasingly asked in religious studies through the lens of media and mediation. 
This paper draws on insights from the media turn in religious studies and anthropology, particularly the work of anthropologists like Brigitte Meyer, Webb Keen, and Aisha Beliso de Jesus, among others, whose ethnographic approaches to the study of religion center form and materiality. Meyer, in particular, suggests that we conceive of religious communities as, quote, aesthetic formations. Aesthetic in the sense that they emerge through distinct sensorial and embodied practices or routines, formations in order to emphasize the processual, never-ending character of producing community. She proposes that we study religious communities as aesthetic formations by paying attention to what she calls sensational forms. That is, condensations of practices, attitudes, and ideas that structure religious experiences and hence ask to be approached in a particular manner. An ethnographic approach centered on sensational form asserts that divine presence and other religious phenomena are always mediated by particular semiotic processes and mechanisms and entrained aesthetic capacities, and likewise asserts that technologies of mediation are always embedded in particular social formations and are co-constituted with discrete modes of subjectivity. In this paper, I will be thinking about the forms of technological mediation that were adopted to preserve musical worship and spiritual practices during the stay-at-home orders of 2020 as sensational forms. By doing so, I consider what sorts of communities and subjects are co-produced by the Zoom church and other practices and technologies of mediation. In May of 2021, as COVID vaccination rates increased in New York State and some religious communities began to resume in-person worship, the New York Times published an article by Tariro Nzezewa that reflected on the ways black churches in Harlem had managed to continue their musical worship practices a year earlier, when stay-at-home orders and restrictions on gatherings made musical worship as usual impossible. Church members and musicians representing historic neighborhood institutions like Bethel Gospel Assembly, Abyssinian Baptist Church, and Canaan Baptist Church all emphasize in their interviews the heightened urgency to find ways to make and listen to sacred music throughout the pandemic. At that time, Nzezewa writes, quote, church music became a source of strength and a lifeline. Reestablishing that lifeline became a top church priority. Like many worship communities around the world have done, the church communities profiled in the article shifted their services onto live streaming platforms. Some churches had years of experience broadcasting live services to sick and shut-in congregants, while others learned new technologies on the fly. The article recounts in vivid detail the ways in which some choirs struggled to adapt to performing while socially distanced in empty sanctuaries for virtual congregations. And echoing these churches' embrace of cutting-edge streaming and video communication technologies, the online version of the article uses three-dimensional recording and CGI technologies to give the reader an augmented reality experience of one of Bethel Gospel Assembly's choirs singing in a virtual rendering of the church sanctuary. For each of the churches in Mzezewa's article, it was never a question whether they would turn to streaming and video communication technologies to enable virtual collective worship. Instead, the article focuses on the many practical questions of how this shift was to be accomplished, which streaming platforms and what logistical arrangements would work the best. Indeed, even the interactive audiovisual experience serves to underline that this is as much an article about the capacities afforded by communications technologies as it is about the importance of faith and musical worship during times of crisis. Crucially, the apparent compatibility between streaming and video communication technologies and live musical worship hovers as a background assumption here. Even if the virtual worship experience is an attenuated version of the real thing, a live in-person service, something fundamental about musical worship is preserved for congregants. It simply must be, or else we wouldn't have had the phenomenon of so-called Zoom church at all. The story of another black church in Harlem, only a few blocks away from the churches profiled in the Times article, presents a sharply contrasting attitude towards streaming and video conferencing technologies. At the United House of Prayer for All Peoples, New York Mother House, the doors to the sanctuary remained locked from March 20th, 2020 until late December of that year. 
No services were held, either in person or virtually. Zoom and other technologies were never discussed as options for continuing the ritual calendar of the church, which has traditionally entailed at least two services a day, seven days a week. Clearly, shutting down services meant a tremendous absence in the spiritual lives of members. I should point out from the start that the fact that the House of Prayer did not move services online was neither a consequence of not having the financial or technological means, nor is there any significant theological prohibition against audiovisual media in the United House of Prayer. To the contrary, the organization boasts robust video and audio production and print publishing organs. Every one of their church locations that I have visited features a well-appointed audio booth with cameras and other audiovisual production equipment. When I first began in-person fieldwork at the New York Mother House in January of 2021, I was puzzled by members' descriptions of the past few months, months spent away from their worship community. Why hadn't the House of Prayer done what it seemed like everyone else was doing and moved their services onto Zoom? I wondered, if other churches found ways to hold musical worship on virtual communication platforms pre precisely because there was something vital about live musical worship that they refused to relinquish during isolation, does that mean that United House of Prayer members do not hold musical worship in the same esteem as members of those other churches? And if they weren't attending Zoom church, what did members do instead to satisfy spiritual needs? To what practices did they turn? I'm going to reframe these questions and talk about the media practices that emerged during the months of isolation, but to do so requires that I introduce the United House of Prayer a bit further, especially its distinctive musical worship tradition and its leader. The United House of Prayer for All People on the Rock of the Apostolic Faith, as the organization is officially named, was founded in Massachusetts in 1919 by a Cape Verdean immigrant named Marcelino Manuel de Gracia, who rose to fame under the name Charles Manuel Sweet Daddy Grace. His proselytizing proved effective as he gained tens of thousands of followers and planted houses of prayer throughout the East Coast during four decades of ministry ultimately leading to him becoming a national celebrity. In the 1940s and 50s, Grace supported the development of the trombone-based worship music for which the United House of Prayer is best known today. Reflecting descriptions of the temple bands found in the Old Testament, these trombone shout bands comprise as many as 15 to 20 trombonists, a euphonium player, a bass horn player, it's a sousaphone, and a percussion section. They play hymns and gospel compositions, not exclusive to the denomination, but which are specially arranged for this instrumentation. Worship services are driven by the music these bands play. When they are truly locked and playing on one accord, their music facilitates shouts, moments in the service when the infilling of the Holy Spirit is collectively experienced, rippling throughout the congregation and erupting in dramatic displays of emotion, speaking in tongues and embodied shouting movements. Since Daddy Grace's death in 1960, the House of Prayer has continued under the leadership of a succession of bishops, each also referred to as Sweet Daddy, who are revered as spiritual intercessors and healers and referred to during their term as the Man of God because of their powerful connection with the Holy Ghost. The current leader, Daddy Bailey, has held the position since 2008 when a council of high-ranking elders and apostles elected him following the death of the previous bishop, Daddy Madison. His role as intercessor, mediating between members and the Holy Spirit, is manifest throughout church life. Iconography using his countenance is omnipresent. His face adorns everything from the covers of periodicals, to lapel pins, to pho photographs with m which members carry in their wallets. An assistant pastor at the New York Mother House once explained this abundance of iconography by referring to a scripture in Second Chronicles. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. According to this pastor, this scripture enjoins us to seek the face of the man of, the, of God, that is, da Daddy Bailey, to receive blessings. Here, scripture is approached as readily yielding what is conceived as literal meaning, though this is clearly a particular idiom of literalism. Even more importantly, the meaning should be taken as instructions for a scriptural choreography. Scripture is read as a script to be realized in a structured enactment. 
But in the house of prayer, even what counts as scripture is more complex than simply the text of the King James Version. Given the close spiritual connection between Daddy and the Holy Spirit, Daddy Bailey's words, both sermons and published epistles, are interpreted as ontologically scriptural, which means that they generate community-wide practices of interpretation and action. Even magazines, DVDs, and CDs produced by the church are advertised as produced by Daddy Bailey or under the leadership of Daddy Bailey, which conveys the authorial involvement of the Holy Spirit. So when states began to prohibit gatherings in March of 2020, it was to Daddy Bailey that House of Prayer members turned for instructions. Each May, the House of Prayer publishes Truth and Facts, a yearly magazine updating members on the state of the organization. In 2021, Truth and Facts included several articles recounting Daddy Bailey's guidance during the stay-at-home orders, one of which recalled how he, quote, told pastors to keep the House of Prayer doors open, even if local restrictions prevented services from being held, members were to be allowed a place to bow for prayer. He also wrote to us saying he did not see an end to the epidemic, for now. He said those of us that could get to the Holy Mountain should go, and those of us too ill to go should stay home. Watch the House of Prayer DVDs and CDs because, quote, that's where I will be. Let us first note what Daddy Bailey did not recommend, that is, moving services onto an online platform like Zoom. Daddy Bailey's first provision was to keep the doors to many houses of prayer open so that worshipers could, quote, get to the Holy Mountain. The Holy Mountain is another scriptural citation, drawing on passages from Exodus and Isaiah in particular, which refer to the Har Kodesh, or Holy Mountain, as a destination for offering sacrifices and re receiving blessings. House of Prayer members refer to the pulpits in their church sanctuaries as holy mountains. On each holy mountain can be found a resplendent chair, referred to as the, quote, throne of grace. When Daddy Bailey travels to each house, it serves as his seat of honor, but even in his absence, it remains a physical point of orientation during worship. Members often quote Hebrews 4.16, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We can see this scripture as well, uh, prom printed prominently in the 2021 edition of Truth and Facts, along with a series of photos of holy mountains and thrones of grace from edifices around the organization. The emphasis is clear. This scripture and its realization in physical space establishes a defined scriptural choreography. The implications during a period of stay-at-home orders should also be clear. This is not a practice that can be readily transposed into virtual space. One cannot come boldly into the throne of grace on Zoom. But that's okay. Daddy Bailey also said that those who cannot make it to the House of Prayer should stay home and, quote, watch the House of Prayer DVDs and CDs because, quote, that's where I will be. Finally, we've come to the modes of technological mediation towards which members turned during the 2020 stay-at-home orders. What exactly are these media forms and how do members use them? To demonstrate, let us turn to a published testimony from the July 2020 issue of Bailey Magazine, the organization's quarterly periodical, to see how these media practices are represented in organizational narratives. And while it's up here, I just want to quickly note that the cover features images of House of Prayer CDs and DVDs superimposed over an image of Daddy Bailey, quite telling. Um, the testimony, entitled Daddy Bailey Was All in My Room, is attributed to Saint Lady D. Madison, the widow of Daddy Madison, Daddy Bailey's precursor as bishop. Saint Lady Madison describes her serious hospitalization with COVID and several additional conditions in March of 2020. She reports that, in keeping with Daddy Bailey's instructions, the medical staff attending to her played CDs of shout band music. These CDs are compilations of professionally recorded shout band performances engineered by the organization's Minister of Music and personally selected by Daddy Bailey. Crucially, the recordings are made in House of Prayer sanctuaries during services. They capture an actual service in progress. Just so we have a sense of what St. Lady Madison might have heard, here is a clip from a performance by the Bailey Hummingbirds of Portsmouth, Virginia, one of the shout bands, playing The Storm is Passing Over, an old Charles Tin Tinley hymn. 
Listen closely and you will hear whoops and exclamations of hallelujah from musicians overcome with the spirit while playing, indexes of the liveness of this recording. Also note the joyous buoyancy of the groove. I've also included some of the end of the performance so that you can hear the intensity achieved during the instrumental outro of, of the piece, known as Back Time. Encourage my soul And let us journey on For the night is dark And it won't be very long So in addition to listening to recordings like this one, St. Lady Madison reports that a dig digital photo frame was brought to her hospital room loaded with images of Daddy Bailey, videos from House of Prayer services, and more music. She even got to Zoom directly with the man of God himself, Daddy Bailey. She insists that even her medical staff, quote, attested to the undeniable connection between her recovery and God's grace and mercy through Daddy Bailey. St. Lady Madison's testimony and the many others published in Bailey Magazine function above all else as normative descriptions, offering models for engagement with the United House of Prayer's sensational forms. This testimony is exemplary for the range of media it describes, but even more because of the way it reads like a script, demonstrating the right ways to interact with audiovisual media. We can see how listening to House of Prayer CDs and watching videos of past services serves to consolidate the spiritual authority of the bishop, Daddy Bailey. By na narrating Daddy Bailey's presence throughout the testimony, Saint Lady Madison reinvests sensational forms with the capacity to mediate Daddy's presence in the ways that he requires. At this point, let's step back and recognize just how sharply this paradigm of engaging with audiovisual media contrasts with the paradigm exemplified by the online worship described in the New York Times article. It is by teasing out the distinctions between these contra two contrasting paradigms of mediation that I want to conclude my talk. For the churches that opted to move services online, musical worship and liveness are fundamentally interarticulated. If an encounter with presence is the goal of worship, that presence is conceived as a feature of a live and, albeit virtually, co-present performance of worship. What is crucial for these worshipers is that they are sharing time and space, that they are in sync. This is the idiom of liveness they are prioritizing. Moreover, in order to provide the most convincing experience of liveness, the technological platform must be as discreet as possible, receding from attention. When the Times article celebrates the technologies used to move worship online at the onset of the pandemic, what is really being celebrated is the capacity of these technologies to recede into the background and seemingly become intermediaries, that is, mechanisms of pure repetition which do not alter or influence that which is mediated. The goal of this paradigm is to replicate as closely as possible an in-person worship experience, prioritizing a fungible and transposable liveness along the way. This is another way of saying that in this paradigm, collective or corporate worship is about being together, but being together in a highly mutable sense. On the other hand, what we have shown about the United House of Prayer is that their mediation practices and technologies, their sensational forms, do not have as their asymptotic goal the seamless reproduction of a live service, nor is being together an end in itself or a step towards presence unless that being together is scripturally sound. 
Nothing could be more anathema to members of the House of Prayer than the idea that live musical worship is infinitely transposable transposable onto media platforms because worship in the house of prayer is the enactment of defined scriptural choreographies realized in all their embodied spatialized i'm on the last yeah uh realized in all their embodied spatialized and effective dimensions in the house of prayer one either enacts the scriptural uh choreographies properly by making one's way to the holy mountain listening, worshiping in person, and listening and moving with sacred shout bands, or one interacts with a recording of this process. As Daddy Bailey said, that is where he'll be. This is an alternative idiom of liveness. Here, the liveness of a recording of past worship is preferred to ostensibly more live communication technologies. To respond to a question I posed earlier, Not participating in Zoom church does not mean that the House of Prayer does not value musical and collective worship. Rather, they are demonstrating the inviolability of these practices by suggesting that they cannot be respatialized or transposed into virtual space. That these House of Prayer sensational forms produce worship as scripturally choreographed in these precise ways is the very means by which the Holy Spirit and Daddy Bailey's authority comes to be embodied. This is an aesthetic formation in process. This is also how one old-time religion continues to thrive in the third decade of the 21st century, even during the devastation and isolation of COVID, not by resisting technological mediation, but by carefully developing sensational forms that reproduce the authority of scripture and of the Holy Spirit. Thank you. super interesting and did interrelate really well. Um, I'm really uh, thrilled to see uh, them together and wonder who has questions. Please address your questions to one or the other or both of our panelists. And I'll recognize people and then they can answer. Yes. I always have a lot of questions. I'm very much interested, thank you for uh, what you shared, but I'm very much interested in your emotional connection to it. Like I hear your research in it, but I'm curious about what prompted you, um, Abimbola, to to the work that that you're doing. I, I I don't know if you, after your research, do you agree with something? Do you not agree with something? Um, and I guess I'm asking the same thing of you. By the way, what you shared reminded me of, I don't know if you know of Dr. York in Bushwick. It was that kind of cultish kind of, um, I'm sorry, did I just be judge- judgmental with that? Um, this kind of cultish vibe that I'm getting from that church. I was curious about that, but still wanting to know both of your feelings behind it. Now that you do the research, now what? Thank you very much. I, I didn't start this work with the church per se, but I started with a pastor because it was a very controversial figure. He, unfortunately, he died last year, and so it just put a stop to all kinds of possibilities. But I started to look at him because he started as this um, figure of uh, syncretic African practice, like mixing Islam, Christianity, African traditional religions. And then along the line, he transmuted into a Pentecostal pastor. And he was illiterate. He couldn't read and write, right? And his associates started to say that in those days, he would struggle with speaking English and stuff. But we told them that one day, I'm going to take this gospel to the world. And by the time he died, people had come from different part of the world to see him. So I was really interested in the arc of his life. And so during the pandemic, it started that he, while other churches were having serious problems, they were complaining against the government and things, they just started to roll out this infrastructure of digital church. And then the next thing, they had set up this very exclusive studio, and they were just producing. And it was really amazing to see, right? Because you were looking at other ones who 
I don't have a problem with their policy. I mean, let me say that from an academic point of view, I see why they had to push conspiracy theories, anti-government, and resistance, because they needed to make that argument to assert themselves. If you close churches for months or indefinitely, people will get to the point that their habit of going to church will be broken, and they might not return. So you had to constantly say, this is a demonic attack, this is the devil. You had to turn it into a spiritual warfare to give people an enemy to punch so that you can continue, you will have a life after the pandemic. But their church was different. They didn't go through all of that. They just started to roll out infrastructure, and it was really very fascinating to see the innovativeness. Can you just repeat the, the dimension of the question that you were directing to me? Sorry. I'm, I'm trying to understand the, it seems like you entered the research from one way and then, I don't want to say stumbled, onto the United uh, House of Prayer, which then opened up to something that reminds me of Dr. Jorgen Bushwick, which is, is coming across as culty. But I'm wondering what was your entrance point, and then now that you've done this research, I'm always curious, uh, now what? Right. So uh, my point of entry for this research, um, we've heard from some uh, artist practitioners earlier today. I, I'm a musician, and I. Um, professionally played with, with some of the musicians from this tradition. Uh, and they, uh, they're, you know, we, we talk in anthropology about different forms of insider, uh, uh, you know, different skills that you can use to, to you know, find your points of entry into uh, a community. And in some ways, being a, a musician serves as a sort of insider uh, knowledge. But there are tons of other ways in which I am never going to be an insider uh, in, in, in this community. Um, but I, you know, using music and, and making music with other uh, people has been a great way to get into environments where I'm able to do my participant observation, do my, 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 my field work. Um, yeah, I understand. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Other yeah. ideas, comments? Questions, feedback, Professor Hume. Uh -huh. Yeah, so. Uh, oh, sorry, Professor Hume, and then whoever oh, was oh. about to speak, if you don't. Yeah. Yeah. I'm I'm still trying to think about what I'm I'm wanting to ask, but it, it has something to do with charisma and mm. the the very ways in which the two individuals you're looking at um, um, had a, a particular charismatic spirit about them, and I'm drawn to um, other. Uh, I would call them Afro-Christian faith systems within the Caribbean, which are um, from the periods of enslavement, the colonial period, really much driven by these charismatic figures. And I'm speaking or thinking specifically of Kapo, of the revivalist church of, of, of um, Edward and Bedwardism. These are traditions coming out of Jamaica. So I was curious whether in your um, if you were, you know, even in thinking about the possibilities of a kind of trajectory of a certain kind of black masculine charismatic mm -hmm. figure that isn't just starting now in this moment of the pandemic, but has been a, a, a mainstay in terms of African diaspora, Christian traditions, which stems over time in different localities of the African diaspora. Um, I know it's beyond what you're doing here, but I'm just kind of, it brought up these, especially the images you show, yeah. and um, what, you've, what you've just offered, Ambimola, in terms of your response. Just the power of charis charisma, and mas a per particular kind of masculinity that is being performed within these spaces. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. You know, there's this historian of Pentecostalism that said that our village priests became our Pentecostal pastors, like, right? It's like you see that continuity in the kinds of demands that we make of them and the ways that they were the ones that manipulate symbols. They, they, be, they moved from that um, African traditional practices and then they 
you know, gradually evolved. And even when you look at even the structure of Pentecostalism in Africa, its entire skeletal system is the African traditional religion. Now, if they are in this room, they are going to contend it with me that they have nothing that have established that break between African practices and their Christianity. But the reality is that it is part of where even the charisma of the faith itself comes from. Its practices, its spirituality, the epistemologies about what happens in the spiritual world, they take a lot from African traditional religion. They create theirs and then project it on African traditional religion. So you see that historical continuities of the ways people have always related to this traditional spiritual figure in the ways that they relate to the pastors. It's, it's always there. It's transhistorical in that sense. And just building on, on what you've already said, I, you know, I can't help but think of uh, Du Bois and Souls talking about the most original figure in America, the, the black preacher, and talking about that in the context of sort of a retentions argument and, and thinking about the, the reproduction of African systems of, of religious life. Um, and, and I just want to second this like focus on thinking of charisma as not a maybe not uh, a singular phenomenon, but really something that needs to be uh, contextualized and, and we need to think about the, um, you know, the, the aesthetic practices of charisma. How does charisma get uh, reproduced or produced in, 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 in a specific environment? Um, and that, that's, a, that's a big focus of my, my dissertation work. Thank you for that. And it occurs to me we're forming a community in these next couple of days. So please, when you ask a question, identify who you are um, so we can all begin to get to know each other. And um, would you start the person who's been asking the excellent questions next to Colin? Would you just say the other direction, Colin, the, um, the person who's asked the excellent questions so far? What's your name? Omar. <laughs> Nadalka. Nadalka. Okay, wonderful. We'll we'll get to know each other better, I think, that way. And then, person in the way back, did you? Were you the one that had a question? Yes, I did. Hey, um, what's your name? My name is Kyle Brooks. Right. Yeah. So, very briefly, this this turn towards charisma will interest me one because that was my own dissertation work on like black charismatic religious leaders and social movements, but particularly here. I'm thinking of uh, Erica Edwards' text on uh, charisma and the fictions of black leadership. And she talks about this idea of the charismatic scenario, this kind of structure that gives a place for uh, these figures to, to enact a, a kind of scripting of power and authority. And it's really fascinating to me, in your, given your two presentations, how uh, something within the matrix of Pentecostal performance allows for these very different expressions and manifestations. And I'm just curious um, what you might think it is about uh, Pentecostalism as a kind of charismatic structure that uh, uniquely enables this uh, wide like, range of uh, performative possibilities. Uh, thank you. That's a really great question. I think it goes to the heart of the fact that Pentecostalism is a decentralized kind of religion. It's pretty liberal. There is no central structure. There is no rigid organizational format. Everybody can claim the authority of a divine vision, and then you set up your own church. And amidst like thousands of churches, everybody competing, you can be as innovative as possible. You can go to a lot of extent, you know, do so many things. You can, it's, I think that format allows them a lot of creativity. There is no rigidity to some of the practices. Although maybe when you look at the ones that have now established a network, where they now try to impose a structure, you find a lot of some kind of um, formality, you know, traditions there. But generally, they, can, they, they are very expressive. They are anti-tradition, especially the smaller ones or the ones that have no, they have no superintending authority. Part of um, that loose structure is what gives them that room to do a lot of things. I don't have a lot to add. I just am thinking in, in 
so the question of what makes Pentecostalism so, uh, you know, such fertile ground for these diverse expressions, I, you know, I think to, uh, back to um, Nimi Bwariboko's Pentecostal principle, uh, writing about Pentecostalism as this openness to the miraculous and being characterized by um, practices that are, in, that are ostentatiously open to the miraculous. And, and this being a, a feature of Pentecostalism. And that, you know, that itself is a prompt for so many different uh, expressions. So, so that's just a, a small thing I would add. So good. We might, we have time for one sort of quickish question or comment, if there are any. Yes. Sincerity came up. Um, like as a theme in both of the papers and I was just wondering if you both could just speak to it especially with your, your last um, say, I'm losing your name <laughs> but about the um, the difference between uh, presence as being in sync versus um, you know so, some type of ritual act that we know has has power in it because we felt it when we originally did it and you could probably tap back in it um, through the recording, so, um, but I, I was just wondering how, how sincerity came up in both of your work. That's great. What's your name, please? My name is Byron, Byron. All right. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't have a, I don't have a, a, a programmed answer for this, this question, which is a huge question in, in, uh, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of, like, Webb Keen's work on sincerity, uh, in, in, um, uh, Indonesian, uh, Calvinism. And thinking about how sincerity itself also has genres, there are idioms of sincerity, and so that's that's definitely something I'm paying attention to in my work and trying to trying to, to figure out. But uh, yeah, I mean, that's an important thing to be attentive to. Sorry, I thought I didn't know that question was for me, but I um, I really don't have much to add about this. I think. Uh, I'm looking at it from the point of view of performance and how certain um, ideas or the belief or the faith itself has prefigured all of these actions, and that's part of what makes it work. You know, that's what helps the construct. 